Um, welcome to a Consensus Quorum webinar uh, with Web3 Labs. Um, we're going to be going through how to integrate Web3J with Consensus Quorum. Um, so I'm sure a few of you are probably already familiar with, uh, uh, with Consensus Quorum, but we'll do a brief uh, run through of, of what that is and uh, you know, what we're doing here. And also um, we'll give some background and context to Web3, to Web3 Labs. Uh, before we get started, um, just a bit of a back of house um, for participation. If you, for some reason, have uh, access to speak, um, please mute. Um, if you have any questions, please drop them in the in the uh, chat box. Uh, we'll do some Q and A at the end, um, and then Grace will be doing will answering some questions throughout the process. Um, but yeah, we'll be saving those to the end. Content uh, this will be recorded, so if you're coming in late uh, or you have a friend that's coming in late and they want to catch the recording, we will have this. Uh, we are currently recording and we'll send it to you uh, all after uh, after the demo. Uh, let's give a, some brief introductions. Um, as I said, I'm Matt. I uh, work with Consensus. I am our uh, developer community lead. Um, I focus uh, specifically on Consensus Quorum. And then uh, previously to this, I was at JP Morgan working on Quorum uh, for the past two years as their developer community lead. Um, and so we'll uh, pass the mic to Connor, I'll give it a quick introduction. Hey, Connor. So sorry, I've made the classic sin of being muted. Uh, is, is my video showing up there now? Yeah, yeah, we're all good. Right. Uh, hey, everyone. I'm Connor Svensson, the CEO and founder of Web3 Labs. Web3 Labs is a blockchain technology company. We work with large enterprises to simplify complex business processes with the power of blockchain. Um, I've been very involved in uh, the, the technology space for the last few years, well, specifically blockchain technology. Um, I wrote uh, the Web3J library. It was first released back in 2016, and uh, Web3 Labs really has grown uh, you know, off the back of supporting the Web3J library, but also working with some, uh, you know, some, some large corporates on their blockchain initiatives. And um, we have a number of products, including our Epris Blockchain Explorer. Um, I will pass you over now to Rashid from my team, who's also going to be talking uh, today. Yeah, hello, everyone. Welcome to this webinar. My name is uh, Rashid Shemi. I joined Web3Labs some time ago as a blockchain platform developer. I have been maintaining Web3J since then and also working on different blockchain-related projects. Welcome to this webinar. I'll leave you with Matt to continue the presentation. Awesome. Thank you, gentlemen. So we'll be going through, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we'll give a quick intro to Consensus Quorum, uh, what is Web3J, how do you, why we use it, um, then Rashid is going to go through a demo of uh, Quorum Quick Start as well, um, how to deploy uh, Web3J uh, with Quorum. <clears throat> All right. So what is Consensus Quorum? Uh, for those that are new here, um, it's essentially enterprise Ethereum. Uh, Consensus Quorum is a open source protocol layer that allows enterprises to build on Ethereum-based blockchain solutions and it's optimized for business applications to process private transactions within a known group of participants. Um, a bit of uh, architecture, we have two um, flavors, uh, essentially, with two Ethereum clients. Uh, one is Hyperledger Bezu, uh, which is Java-based and is compatible with mainnet. It's also Apache 2 open source licensed um, and works uh, great for uh, private networks. As well, we have GoQuorum, uh, which was built and maintained by JP Morgan for some time um, and is a fork of GoEtherm. <clears throat> so it's built on Golang uh, primarily. And uh, same, same as Bezu, it's um, a private, uh, private version of Ethereum that allows for a group of known participants. Um, on top of that, we have uh, down here, we have the Ethereum clients that we just mentioned, Bezu and GoQuorum. However, each have their own corresponding transaction manager. Um, so for Hyperledger Bezu, we have Orion. Uh, for GoQuorum, we have Tessera. And then we have um, a bit of uh, delegation of duties by having um, our ETH signer um, uh, separate from the transaction managers uh, to sign um, transactions um, and um, you know, maintain a, a consensus on the network. We also have uh, 
uh, now we have consensus quorum support. Uh, so we have SLAs at different levels uh, where if you're an enterprise and you are building with consensus quorum and you want to um, essentially have engineering support on hands, uh, we, we now are able to integrate that with your, with your platform and services. Uh, and if you want more information on that, we're more than happy to uh, talk to your team and, uh, you know, get you connected with our, uh, with our engineers and our support team as well. Cool. So some of the key benefits uh, to consensus quorum uh, we'll go through. Uh, first and foremost being permissioning. Uh, so the support for private and public transactions. Um, we have different levels of permissioning. We have, uh, we have node permissioning, which allows peer-to-peer -peer, uh, network access for uh, a um, set of allowed nodes to enter the network. And then we have uh, account permissioning, which restricts peer-to-peer -peer access um, to only an allowed set of nodes uh, to view the state of a given uh, transaction. Um, so privacy within privacy. Um, next, we have uh, privacy. Uh, we use advanced encryption techniques for a lot of these uh, transactions uh, to ensure that uh, we only have permission entities that are accessing the network. Uh, we have various levels of encryption um, that uh, was very important for, for enterprises. Uh, it's decentralized. So there's no dependency on a central service or party. Um, although it is a private network, um, it, we're still able to maintain consensus. Um, Bring us to the next point, customizable, interoperable, um, and easy to deploy. Um, we have pluggable consensus so with both protocols. Um, we ha have the opportunity to use, um, well, for Hyperledger Bezu, you can use um, Proof of Authority or IBFT. Um, with uh, GoQuorum, you can use um, Proof of Authority, um, IBFT, Raft. Um, you basically get to uh, choose what kind of consensus you want to use. Um, our clients are EVM compatible, so they're built on top of Ethereum. Uh, you don't have to change uh, uh, your infrastructure, your uh, Ethereum infrastructure at all. You just added various plugins or extensions to modify your network. Um, anything that is built on public Ethereum, you can use uh, with private Ethereum. Um, so feel free to check out some cool tools. Um, you know, you can run a network, uh, a core network, and, and use MetaMask to play around with uh, your transactions. Um, that's something you want to test out. Um, and then we have a lot of uh, quick deployments uh, that you can set up uh, to configure um, uh, these private versions of Ethereum. You can use our Quorum Quick Start, which Rashid's gonna go through later. Um, and then we have a bunch of other uh, deployments that you can check out in our docs um, from Kubernetes to some other um, you know, quick starts we have with Hyperledger Bezu. Uh, community. So because it's built on Ethereum, we're able to leverage uh, the world's largest blockchain uh, developer community. Um, as well, we, uh, we are founding members of uh, the EA. Um, so we have 150 plus enterprises that support um, and are able to um, you know, keep in touch with the things we're doing around enterprise uh, for Ethereum. Uh, it's been battle, battle tested. So Ethereum has been in production since 2013. Uh, GoQuorum was in production since 2015. And then uh, Hyperledger Bezu in uh, 2018. So we've uh, had some time behind the uh, protocols um, and we've seen uh, quite an increase in enterprise adoption the past few years. And so there's uh, been a lot of demand there. Bit of high level design on uh, a Google Quorum specific uh, node um, and infrastructure. Um, so if we look on the far left here, we have the node, the uh, Google Quorum node. Um, uh, it's, it's a modified version of, of Geth. Uh, so we took fork of Geth and we added some privacy features, um, added permissioning. Uh, we added this pluggable consensus um, as well. Um, and a lot of this has, has led to a high throughput. And a lot of these decisions were uh, due to enterprise demand. Um, they loved Ethereum, but they needed some of these modifications for an enterprise environment. Um, now, in terms of like delegated duties, as we mentioned earlier, we have this private transaction manager uh, to Sarah, um, and uh, we have the Enclave that's able to um, delegate the signing of the transactions and um, uh, maintain uh, consensus among all this. Uh, we also have uh, the DAP, DAP layer. You can see where you can have an application layer on top of the node um, while you're running your private transactions. And as you notice below, we have all the tools that you could use and, and libraries um, with Ethereum that are compatible with uh, 
with GoCorm and Beza. Uh, so just show you like a brief kind of flow of how a transaction works um, on GoCorm specifically. Um, you know, for a lot of enterprises, they, you know, simply need to maintain consensus uh, amongst the nodes and send a transaction um, and, um, you know, basically send this information to all of the blocks um, and make sure that we have um, a shared ledger. And for some enterprises, that might be enough. Um, however, what GoQuorum did is we added this private for field where you can essentially, um, you know, send uh, send uh, transactions to a, a group of uh, participants. Uh, for example, in this case, we have node A and node B, but we don't want to send the information to node C. Uh, you would essentially have their um, their public addresses listed in this private for field. And uh, when you send the transaction, uh, it'll correspond with its given uh, to Sarah transaction manager. And each node has their own uh, delegated uh, uh, transaction manager, their own to Sarah. And when you send the transaction, it'll uh, send an encrypted payload to the node, or sorry, to the transaction manager. And the node will, um, or sorry, the transaction manager will send that information to the other, uh, other known party within that's privy to the transaction. And then they will send a hash back to the node, uh, which will be stored there uh, and acknowledge that they received the transaction. Um, there's no data saved on the chain. It's simply storing a hash and a hash is sent to the other uh, nodes. And if they were uh, a party to the transaction, they'll be able to decrypt the payload um, and essentially um, un un unbox the information that was, that was given to them. However, if they were not uh, made a party to the transaction, so they were not given this private four field, uh, they do not know that transaction ever existed. Um, so as you can see in Tessera C here, they um, were not able, able to uh, encrypt or sorry, decrypt the payload um, and register that that transaction was uh, was valid. However, the nodes um, are still acknowledging the fact that on the public, um, the public uh, transaction within this private uh, network, they're able to um, maintain consensus uh, of this shared ledger. Um, and yeah, so that's how we, that's how we see privacy. Um, that being said, uh, hopefully I didn't talk too much, but I'll give it a give it off to Web3 Labs team. Uh, let them show you how uh, Web3J works with all this. Thanks, Matt. So Web3J, it's basically an integration library for the Java and Android platforms. This picture explains you know, in, a, in a simplistic manner what it does. On the left, you have your Java on Android or Android application. And then you have Web3J, which basically talks the, to the Ethereum client for you. The big advantage here is that you don't need to write that uh, integration code yourself if you're making use of Web3J. And on the right here, you have these, the Ethereum network, which is made up of all these different nodes talking to one another. If we go on to the next slide, please. So apart from just talk the native wire protocol to Ethereum nodes, which you know, makes the actual communication part a lot more straightforward for your applications, Web3J, it, it also enables you to deploy, call and transact with your smart contracts. When I first started writing the library, you know, in my naivety back then, really, I was thinking, you know, how complicated could this stuff be? You know, we've got this JSON RPC protocol and you just need to you know, create wrapper code around it. But where it does get quite complex is with re respect to smart contracts and transactions in Ethereum, insofar as the Ethereum virtual machine has got its own type system there. Those types don't map to you know, a standard 64-bit uh, CPU architecture, which is used in most people's laptops or on you know, servers these days. And so what Web3J does is it actually does this type mapping. So you know, Java being a statically typed language, uh, it, it, you, Web3J basically enables you to take Java types and they get mapped automatically to Ethereum types. So you get the type safety of both, lang of, of both platforms within your programming, which is a very key point just to take on board because otherwise you've got to do this stuff yourself, which means encoding and decoding various different types that are defined in the Ethereum virtual machine. 
as the library's grown over the years as well, sorry, if we just stay there, please. It, as the library's grown over the years, we've also continually strived to make it more, you know, provide a better developer experience as well. So, you know, of course, what I've spoken about here is more sort of library type integration, but the reality of when you're working with blockchain platforms or any you know platform that you want to integrate, it's not just about the code integration, it's also providing great support for your build tooling as well, so that your development workflow uh, is as fluid as possible. And so Web3J provides native builds a tool support for the Gradle and Maven uh, build plugins, which are the, the, the major platforms that are used there. Uh, as I mentioned, it it's works with smart contracts, which requires transaction management, but there's also this notion of Ethereum accounts and wallets, which again, it provides support for. And there's command line tools uh, that it ties up to. With respect to the actual Ethereum platforms as well, um, you know, it, it, it provides specific variants, which are really a superset of the core Web3J library for both Hyperledger Basu and Consensus Quorum as well as like the you know the commonly used clients on uh, some of the other um, clients such as geth and open ethereum as well if we go on to the next slide please so as, as i alluded to earlier the library it was first released back in the september 2016 just in time for devcon 2 and since then it's approaching 1 million downloads it's had now over 130 contributors and the project's coming up to 3000 github stars Notable users include JP Morgan, the Opera browser, UBS, and Samsung. And then, so in terms of when you actually want to use Web3J, I've, I've covered some of the core features there, but in terms of you know, the actual tasks that you want to, you know, you may want to achieve, hopefully this will prompt your thinking into understanding really where it makes the most sense. So at one level, you've got an application and you want to be able to query an Ethereum or Quorum blockchain. And so if you want to pull out details of all the blocks or transactions or the different events being emitted by smart contracts, that's something that Web3J makes it really easy to do. You know, we're talking two lines of code, one line to connect to the ads, to connect to your node, and the next to say register a callback every time a specific method is called on a smart contract or a new transaction is created. Then there's the actual developer workflow as well. So when you actually create a new project from scratch, Web3J can take care of this for you, which Rashid will be running through shortly. It can also generate unit tests for you as well. And then once you've generated those unit tests, it can test them in different scenarios because at one level, you might just want to do your unit tests, which you know run quickly and verify that a smart contract behaves as expected. But you might also want to have more you know, specific integration testing where you work with a real live network that say mirrors the versions of the applications you're using in your production or you know, end deployment environments. And there you can have a Docker file that spins up a, a simulated network that matches the one you want. And Web3J can run tests against that for you very easily. I said earlier too about the, the capabilities for deploying and integrating with smart contracts. Um, so this is achieved through what we call smart contract wrappers. So you have a smart contract written in Solidity. Web3J can compile that using the Solidity compiler and then basically create Java hooks that the Java or Android developer calls that actually perform certain actions on that smart contract. And then finally, too, we recently re released Web3J Open API, which enables you to automatically generate open API compliance services off the back of a smart contract. So if you're thinking about you know, creating uh, an API based microservice, Web3J Open API can do that for you automatically with just the Solidity contract. So it's a very powerful piece of infrastructure that we've built there. The next slide. So we touched uh, briefly as well on Web3J Quorum uh, and, you know, sorry, we touched on Web3J support for Quorum and Hyperledger Basu and uh, other Ethereum nodes. This is the case as well with Web3J Quorum. The project is actually called Web3J Quorum. So when we talk about Quorum support, the, the, the key features here is that it can take advantage of the Go Quorum client specific methods and the privacy associated with it and by extension, the actual Tessera enclave that it uses. So the privacy techniques that Matt discussed a few slides ago, those are fully supported if you're using Web3J Quorum. The project location is there, and we also have a sample project using it that demonstrates the privacy of it um, in a token use case, which again, Rashid will be going through in a little bit more detail. 
imminently. Okay, so I'm going to hand over to Rashid, who's going to uh, run with the demo here. Awesome. Rashid, I'll stop sharing so you can uh, share your screen. Okay, thank you. Can you allow me, please? Yep, let me find you. Should be the host now. I'm hoping that gives you the duties. There you go. Okay, perfect. Okay, so let's get started and see how this works. So as a simple introduction to Web3J, we'll, be, we'll use our Web3J CLI, which will let you create ready to deploy decentralized applications from your smart contracts and interact with the Ethereum blockchain easily. To install the CLI, we run these commands. Uh, let me run them. Okay, it's curl and then pipe it to shell. Uh, obviously I have it already installed on my system, but uh, if you execute the ca this command, you should be good to go. And then we're gonna go to the most basic way we can interact with, um, with, uh, with the Ethereum blockchain is through our, uh, our Gradle project that we, that we generate. So we go to Web3J new, Web3J. Uh, what this command will do is to generate a Gradle project uh, depending on the Web3J core library and we'll be able to deploy smart contracts uh, to the Ethereum blockchain and interact with it. As you can see from its help menu, we have uh, support for Hello World, which is a uh, just basic contract and ERC20 and ERC777 Cohen implementations. These Cohen implementations uh, follow the Open Zeppelin library. So let's start by creating a new project and see this up close. Also, you can you can uh, switch the language of generation from Java to Kotlin using the dash dash Kotlin flag. Uh, actually creating a new project will take some time for the first time you run it because it will be generated, which will be downloading all the dependencies, Gradle dependencies, etc. However, subsequent builds will be significantly faster. Right now, let's jump to the code and see what we have there. So as you can see, this is the usual Gradle structure, Gradle project structure. We have our build.gradle. In here, we have uh, our plugin section. The most important plugin that we have is uh, Web2j uh, Gradle plugin. This uh, Web2j Gradle plugin, what it, will, what it will do is it will let us uh, take the smart contracts that exist in these two directories, hello world uh, in uh, Solidity. It will take this hello world and it will generate a Java wrapper on top of it. So instead of having to code your interactions with the, with the Ethereum and also deploy smart contracts, etc., cetera, uh, using manual way, you will be provided by a class containing all the methods that you will need. So after generating this uh, using this plugin, actually this plugin will give you access to these two tasks, generate contract wrappers and generate test contract wrappers. So after executing it, you will find uh, in here in build generated, uh, you will find this uh, hello world class in here. This is the default uh, generation output directory, but it can be configured obviously. What you see here is that we have uh, a smart, uh, we have a Java class as the same uh, with the same name as the smart contract that we have. Uh, we have here the binary, which will be executed when we, uh, for example, ex uh, deploy this transact this uh, contract. And then, as you will see, we have uh, some methods that we can call. For example, this greeting method. If you see, it is the exact same one as this uh, greet greeting method in here. And it returns it returns a string. So if you check in here, we return a string. So instead of having to call this interaction yourself, you just call the hello world. Uh, Java wrapper and then call the greeting method and it will return the result for you. And also we have two special methods which are load and deploy. Uh, the load will load the smart contract from if it is already deployed and you want to interact with it and the deploy will actually deploy the smart contract for you. Let's jump in to see the generated code. And before we check the, the generated code, let's check the, the generated tests. And again, uh, here we use our Web3J EVM implementation to uh, VM implementation to run the test. Actually, EVM is uh, Web3J EVM is that it uh, creates uh, an EVM in memory and lets you execute unit tests against it so that you can test your smart contracts and also be able to interact with the 
with the so with the and also to be able to like test uh, all the functionalities of your contract using unit tests. Okay, so as you can see, this is a generated code. And as you can see, we need to specify some environment variables to be able to deploy the project and also interact with the, our Hello World smart contracts. These environments are WebPJ node URL and the wallet password and the wallet path. So as you can see, the interaction can be coded easily. At first, here we go and start by loading the credentials, and then we go to create our WebPJ instance, which is a JSON RPC service that's gonna be uh, making requests to 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 nodes. And then we use our generated wrapper that we just discussed in here, and use the deploy method, and give it these parameters, and also the constructor in here, and then make the request. After all of this being after deploying the smart contract, we'll get its address and then print the return of the greasing method. So to run this, we use the application plugin. That's why we have uh, the application plugin defined in the project and we can run this. I've already said the environment variable I was just speaking about, the wallet password, the wallet path, and also the, and also the node endpoint. It might take some time to deploy the smart contract depending on the network you are, you are targeting and also on So as you can see, we have here the logs. Hope you can see the logs clearly. Oh, uh, we have here we are sending, we are making a bunch of interactions with the uh, with Rinkeby. And as you can see, we don't need to do them to code them manually. They are done by Web3J. We have here we get the transaction code count and then we send the raw transaction and then we wait for the transaction to be mined. And then after having, after sending F git transaction receipt, we will receive our transaction receipt and get the contract address along with it. This is the printing statement. And also we have our method message in here, greeting method result, hello blockchain world, which we used in here. Also, I would like to uh, show you that instead, if you, you're not actually interested in using the our hello world, you can use actually Web3J import. And what this command have in special is that it has the ability to specify custom Solidity Pass or Solidity smart contracts. And with this, you can generate the same exact project, but with your, your favorite smart contracts. Also, I would like to touch on the Web3J open API which will let you generate open API compliant services on top, uh, on top of your smart contracts. We have these commands in here. Uh, in my case, I'm gonna use the new command, which is the easiest, easiest because I can just use this hello world uh, template and generate an open API on top of it. Let me generate it. Again, this may take some time if it is the first time you are running it because uh, it will need to download all of the jersey dependencies and everything to be able to run your project. Uh, let's go back to these commands in here. We have, for example, the generate command, WebPJ open API generate command, which will generate the rest on the endpoints for you and jar that will generate a jar for you and import, which is uh, the same as the previous one import, but will you, uh, which will generate on top of your favorite smart contracts, uh, uh, open API compliant service. So right now this project was generated. Let's now jump into the code and see what's happening there. As you can see, let's start by build.gradle. As you can see, we have here, instead of using the Web3J Gradle plugin, we are using the Web3J Open API plugin, which will generate uh, Open API service for you and also document uh, Open API documentation and everything. As you can see, we have here uh, extra tasks to run that. And also after running the generation, you will have, you will see in your build generated sources, Web3J main, uh, you will see here the Java wrapper used, but this time instead of uh, use instead of having to use directly these method methods yourself, the API will do that for you through this API generated in here. As you can see, we have here the endpoints generated and also the interfaces and everything, and also their implementations. So this is ready to be deployed and ready to be run into and start sending HTML. Uh, uh, HTTP requests and also you can access the its uh, open API documentation. So let's run it again using the, the the application plugin run task and then I already have the environment variable set, uh, the wallet path, the wallet password and also the node endpoint as we will need them to to actually interact with the 
with the with the blockchain and then this is the server being run and as you can see it is in localhost 8080 if we access that localhost 8080 and swagger ui we should be able to see this this is actually the generated swagger ui and as you can see we have here the methods that we can call and also the events and everything and for example if we want to deploy a smart contract instead of uh, having to code that and using the wrappers directly we we abstract that layer and just say here hello webinar and then deploy the contract without having to code anything and after actually deploying the contract you see here the example value of the returned address which is uh, returned uh, object which is a json object containing the transaction receipt and you will basically be able to take the transaction receipt from here and the contract address for example and do other interactions with the with the with your smart contract set and then i would like to move to our quorum in, uh, to our quorum integration with uh, with 3j uh, in order to do this we will need the um, We'll, need to, we'll be actually using uh, the Quorum developer quick start in order to create a Quorum network. And then we will be using the WebQJ integration, our WebQJ Quorum integration with the Quorum network. To do so, we'll need Docker and Docker Compose and then in Node.js. And then we're gonna run this command to, to have the projects. Uh, the architecture that we're going to have here is uh, we're going to have three nodes. Each of them have their private transaction managers, as Matt was explaining just now. And uh, these nodes here all uh, are in this network containing um, the validator for the consensus and some other and some uh, and some other containers also running other services also running. And you can get this simply by running this command and uh, following the prompt. And the demo actually will, will take the following scenario. We're going to have the three nodes, node A, B, and C. And then node A will start by creating a quorum token. However, some, node A will specify something, something special with this uh, quorum token is that it will say that in between node A and node B is going to be a group of privacy. So only us will be able to see this uh, quorum, uh, this uh, token. However, node C won't be able to do it. And then we're going to log uh, query the balances. And then obviously node C shouldn't be able to, to see what is happening on that uh, uh, quorum token that we just created. Uh, so let's jump in code i've already created a, a, a box containing docker docker compose and also node.js so that we have i have the same environment as you do and then i'm gonna start by executing that command that we I just showed you which is npx quorum dev quick start and then it's gonna prompt me to some some details like which client I would like to use. I'm going to use uh, Go Quorum. I'm not going to use Orchestrate. And then I'm going to have uh, private transaction support. And also, I don't need this stuff. And then I'm going to leave it to output it in the current directory. So as you can see, we have, we have here the Quorum test network, which is the, which is, sorry, uh, which contains some files, which is the network and Docker Compose file and everything. Uh, we can see them in here. As first, you can see that we have a readme that you can use to understand what is happening in this uh, repository. It will first show you the, um, the different commands that you can run. For example, the run will start all the Docker containers and stop all these, uh, these shell scripts here are here to help you to do it. And also details on the proof of authority network that we have, and also on the architecture and the nodes and everything, and also some strict scripts to run to demo the stuff. And also we're gonna have something here that we're gonna need, which is uh, the configuration of the network. We're gonna access Quorum and then get to the first member, and then we're gonna need its public key. Uh, well, not its public key, but its private transaction manager public key. And we're going to take them in order to use them with our Quorum sample project. The Quorum sample project that Connor was just talking about uh, is uh, you can find it uh, on GitHub. Uh, actually, the link is provided. And this actually demonstrates the creation and the management of a private token on uh, Quorum network. What it will do is that it will 
uh, do the what we just discussed. This this scenario in here is uh, deploy to a token and then interact between two nodes, and then the third one shouldn't be able to see what is happening. And as you can see, the code here. It will be using basically the quorum, what UJ quorum implementation that we did, and we're gonna be we're gonna be dependent on that in order to make our interactions with the quorum network. So uh, at first, what we're gonna do is we're gonna initialize nodes, which is uh, going to be done by this uh, method in here, and we're gonna give it uh, the node, the URLs, and then the public keys. And also the name we're gonna name them, and then we're gonna create accounts in them and uh, unlock those accounts. So let me take the um, sorry, let me take uh, uh, this uh, IP address because I'm gonna need it. Actually, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start the network here, following the Go Quorum the Quorum test uh, network. And then this will create a test network for me. And in order to interact with the nodes that have just been deployed, I'm going to need that IP address. So while this being deployed, I'm going to make the change in here and ask to access this stuff. So, OK, they are the same. Perfect. And after this, we'll, the, we'll deploy. Then we'll be able to run this code. Let's go over the code and see what, what it does. It comes in here, and then we run this run method. This run method will tell you that uh, it starts uh, creating a, by creating a token. However, this cre token creation will be special since it will specify that uh, we're gonna have node A and node B in the same privacy group. However, the other nodes shouldn't be able to see what is happening. Let's get in detail in here of what is happening. So we just call the quorum, which is a wrapper against WebPJ instance, but with that adds new new functions that we're gonna use also for the quorum network. And here we create the transaction manager with the, the participant nodes, which are node A and node B. And then we call this token, which is actually the token uh, wrapper that we generate from this uh, token smart contracts. And as you can see, it's just an ERC20 token. So uh, we use the wrapper and then we deploy the smart contract uh, with this private transaction, with this uh, custom transaction manager. And then we will return its, uh, its instance so that we can do the interactions as we want, same as before. And in here, if you return, uh, after creating the token, we're gonna log the supplies and then log the balances. Actually, node A and node B and node, node B and node Z should have no token at all, and node A will have uh, all the supply. And then what we're gonna do is that we're gonna make the transfer. We're gonna transfer some tokens from node A to node B and also from node node A to node C. However, when we log the balances, we're gonna see the balances. However, if uh, node C tries to to actually, uh, to actually get uh, get the balance, it won't be able to because it's not in the privacy group. All everything it will find is uh, the the transaction payload hash, and when it will check with its private transaction manager, it will say that uh, I don't have the transaction, so we are not part of the privacy group. So we can't see this. And also, I'm gonna burn some quantity in here, and also log the balances to to see this. Let's see if this has been deployed. Okay, so everything has been deployed successfully. If you check, for example, Docker container, uh, we're gonna have this. I'm not sure if it is well readable, but as you can see, we have, for example, this uh, this quorum member, second member has uh, is listening on all interfaces on this port. So basically what we do in here is we just point, we use the IP address of the box and then we point to the, to the actual port it will be listening to. And also we're gonna take the private key, uh, the public key, the private transaction public key from here, which is in the configuration in the quorum test network. So after taking these and replacing them, I think I've already done that. So now we run the project. As you can see, we have here the account being created and also unlocked. Here are the, the corresponding passwords. Yes, we have account in node A and in node B and also in node Z. 
And then what we do is we create a contract uh, using node A as we discussed earlier in the slides. And then ooh, this is the contract address. And this is the account that uh, the, the, the deploy the contract and then we have the available supply so what we're gonna do is we're gonna log the balances so node A has this balance here node B and node Z have nothing and then we're gonna make a transfer of value of the tokens and then node A, node B and node C are gonna have these values however this query is done by node B however if node Z does this query he won't be able to find the, the balances or be able to access the smart contract because uh, he is not in the privacy group and thus uh, he has no access to the bytecode to execute and also has not, no access to the states. And also here we decrease the total supply and also as expected node C shouldn't be able to see it. So with this what we did was uh, so create a token a quorum token from node A and we defined as a privacy group node A and node B and then when we made some transfers and then queried the balances node A and node B are able to see the balance well, however node C is not because it is not in the privacy group. Yeah what we can do too is uh, we can go through questions and then um, we have a final slide uh, uh, Rashid if you're able to pass me back the uh, co-host or the uh, hosting permissions uh, where we have our um, we have our Discord. We have we have Slack. We can also um, kind of show people um, if they have questions applying, um, they can reach out to us there. There we go. Uh, so yeah, so yeah, we'll just we'll take the time now. Um, does anyone have any questions? We'll leave leave this for Q and A. Uh, you're able to uh, message us in the chat box. We can uh, answer there. Uh, let me get back to sharing my screen. And Matt, just a shameless plug for the group here. If anyone wants to provide feedback, if they like this webinar, if they didn't, you know, or you know, what do you want to see next time? You know, if this is just you know part one, you know, we'd love to hear your feedback. Always trying to get better. So uh, I did drop that in the chat. If, if the yeah. attendees don't mind. Um, yeah. So yeah, please give us some feedback. Um, and as Grace mentioned, this is not our um, first nor last uh, webinar. We'll be doing a lot more. Um, so let us know what, um, what you want to learn or hear from, and we'll, uh, get that from you on the feedback form. Uh, as mentioned, uh, find us on discord. Uh, we are in the, uh, quorum general section. If you need the invite to discord, feel free to reach out to me directly. Um, however, if you go to consensus.net, you can find it at the, at the footer of the website. Uh, there's an invite to discord. Um, as well, you can reach us just, uh, via email. We have um, these emails listed below. Um, Grace, was there a question that popped up? I can't really uh, access yeah, my Yeah, it looks like, no, uh, here, let me put on my video too while we're doing the questions. Um, maybe share the Slack and Discord links in the webinar chat. Uh, yeah, I'll do that right now. Cool. <laughs> Good suggestion, thank you. And, yeah, and as mentioned, um, you know, demos, this, this, this tends to happen just uh, for the sake of hacking, hacking or uh, building and deploying live. Um, but uh, yeah, thank you so much, Connor and uh, Rashid for walking us through it. And if anyone's deploying and they have a similar issue, um, you know, I'm sure Rashid's going to figure this out in the next few minutes <laughs> once we drop off. Uh, reach out to us on any of these channels and we'll um, walk you guys through it. Yeah, and we just just to sort of so everyone's aware, we we updated this repo in the last few days to work explicitly with the latest version of the quorum NPX deployment that Rashid discussed here. So it's not that this is you know is old stuff that's not been updated. So you shouldn't have any problems with it. I say shouldn't because uh, you yeah, know the demo gods obviously uh, work their magic here today. But, uh, the demo gods. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Yeah, any questions from the audience? Just maybe thinking about, you know, not just the demo, but earlier on what Matt was talking about, you know, this webinar really covered um, and, and demoed, you know, GoCorum and, and uh, that client. Yeah, so happy to answer questions you have if it's on Basu or, or anything like that. Or you're just gonna make it really easy on us. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, 
Oh yeah, we did get a um, suggestion to share the video with the demo working. Um, I, I definitely think we can do that for sure. Uh, we'll include that in the follow-up materials. Looks like we got a hand raise. Um, Matt, can you see that as host? Or looks uh, like it's Bobby. Can you give Bobby speaking access? Yeah, let's see. Oh, hello. Wait, uh, I can I you hear me? Oh, hey, yes, Bobby. hello. Hi, uh, Bobby Mascara, Ledger Academy. Um, just a question. When you said that um, you, you put the wrappers around the ERC um, 20s, is this going to include all the other standards for tokens as they come across the Ethereum desk? Um, like are you the talking seven, about- seven, seven and the, you know, the ERC 20s are there. Um, and I'm assuming all ERC-20 coin tokens that have been created with that standard are recognized. So going forward, are you going to be recognizing all the other standard? I might be off base with this question, but all the other token standards? So, yeah, if, if the ERC-20 is compatible with like with the EVM, um, it it can work within, within your uh, quorum private network. But, you know, when you're deploying it, it's... Um, it's a group of known participants. Uh, what the token represents is pretty much up to the group, uh, the consortium. So um, the standard will work inside your private network. Um, however, what the standard is outside of that private network, like in public Ethereum, mainnet Ethereum, is um, not necessarily the same, if that makes sense. If I could add on, on to this um, as, as well, please, Matt. Um, yeah, go for it. You know- with, with, with the example project that we've given here, that's of course in the ERC-21, um, if you have a look at the code, you'll see that we use the Open Zeppelin's reference implementation for a lot of this. And so, you know, if, if you have an existing implementation or if you want to take one of the reference implementations of really any, any one of the standardized token formats, it's a very similar process to actually import it into the project. And of course, we can, you know, we can work with you if you need, if you have questions along the way or anything else there. Um, I should mention too, we have a community discord to um, which I'll, I'll, I'll stick in the channel because there's some discussions there. But it, um, yeah, we yeah, it's it's more just about. I think Open Zeppelin is always a great place to start with reference implementations because they cover a lot of the main tokens. Take that, bring it into Web three J, and you'll be able to deploy it on a quorum network in the manner that we showed here without any problems. Thank you very much. Great webinar. Thank you. Thanks, Connor. Um, any other questions? Any raised hands? Looks like we're at the top of the hour too. Um, Perfect timing. Nice. So uh, again, if anyone has any questions, you have the Discord, you have the emails, uh, please reach out to us. Always looking for feedback and, and uh, happy to you know answer your questions. And we'll include the demo, as we mentioned, um, in the follow-up material. So thank you all. Anything and yeah, else, thank you everyone for joining. Thanks, Rashid. Yeah. Thanks, Connor. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, guys. Bye, everybody.